Welcome to the Nicole Chocola Chocolate Masters Hangout, where we'll be talking today about hot chocolate. My name is Rachel Sawatsky, and I'm the owner and chief chocolatier of Coco Nymph Chocolates and Confections in Vancouver, and I've also been a tutor at Ecole Chocolat for seven years. Today we welcome Zahara Mapes from Cho, where she is part of the Bean Team. She's involved in chocolate making and research and development. She also travels and works with Cho Source Program for co-op development to provide training on sensory and quality analysis of fine cocoa. Today we'll be talking about hot chocolate. It's a favorite cold weather treat many of us enjoy. Consuming chocolate as a beverage dates back about 2,000 years to the ancient Mayans who drank it cold and unsweetened. Up until the 19th century, hot chocolate was even used medicinally to treat common ailments such as stomach problems. Personally, I think we should still drink it that way. And uh, Spanish explorers were the ones that introduced the hot chocolate drink to Europe, where it evolved into the beverage that we all know and love today. Hot chocolate is consumed throughout the world and in multiple variations, including the very thick chocolata densa served in Italy and the thinner hot cocoa that is typically consumed in the United States. While hot chocolate made from powdered cocoa is widely available, many chocolatiers make a more sophisticated and rich version, which is sometimes called drinking chocolate. It's made from warmed milk or cream and melted chocolate, and chocolatiers often add their own special ingredients to create unique recipes. To further explain how drinking chocolate differs from hot chocolate, there's a couple of little points. Um, hot chocolate is typically made with a powder that's composed of sugar, cocoa powder, and milk solids, which are then blended together and mixed with milk or water. Now, the opposite is drinking chocolate, which is typically richer, thicker, and it's made with whole chocolate. The creaminess comes from cocoa butter and often full dairy. So it's quite a big distinction. So now that we know a little bit about hot chocolate, let's get into our discussion. So, Sahara, Cho's drinking chocolate has gotten really great reviews. What made Cho decide to develop a drinking chocolate? One of Cho's mottos is to create experiences that delight. And for me, there's really, you know, something beautiful about drinking liquid chocolate. Um, and I would say it's an experience that delights. Um, also, it's really nice to have in a cafe and just creates this incredible dynamic flavor. You don't have to wait for the chocolate to melt for the flavors to explode in your mouth. It's already liquid and the flavors just all hit you at once. So it's just a, a beautiful way to enjoy chocolate. That's fantastic. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you developed the formulation for your drinking chocolate products? Yeah, so um, is one of the first products that we developed, and um, we started with um, single origin dark chocolates when we uh, did the launch the first choc uh, chocolates from the company, and we wanted to design a flavor profile that was really bold and full flavored. And so rather than doing a single origin, we wanted to create a blend. So we worked with all of the different single origin chocolates that we we're making um, at the time it's uh, and still is um, chocolatey from Ghana um, Peruvian is the fruity um, nutty flavor is from Ecuador and bright is from Madagascar so we combined all of our dark chocolates together and worked with blending them to create a nice full flavor where you get some of the rich chocolatey tones from Ghana but you get some of the bright acidic and fruity notes from uh, Peru and Madagascar and also some like deep nutty notes for from Ecuador so it's really like all the flavors at once in this really rich full experience um, and so you know developing that over the time um, the each flavor kind of migrates a little bit so we taste it and balance it out so it's not too acidic but um, still has some complexity to it when we do the formulations so what, what do you think is different about Cho's chocolate from others? Um, I would say that it's really versatile. Um, you know, there's a lot of different um, things you can do with it. You can 
make it with water. Actually, I prefer to make the drinking chocolate with water rather than with the milk solids because when you add in the milk, um, it actually tones down the flavors of the chocolate. Um, so when you drink it with water, you really just get only the flavors of the chocolate and it really can shine, especially with more acidity. Um, when you put the milk in, it can, you know, like we, we developed a um, super berry um, and so that one really doesn't taste good with milk, with the fruity tones. So mm -hmm. the, the thing that I like about the drinking chocolate is that with the cocoa butter in it, it has enough fat in it already, so it creates this really rich, smooth, thick drink, and you can just adjust the thickness depending on your liquid to solid ratio. So um, you can dial it in to any amount of thickness, or you can. Some um, cafes even make it into a thick ganache that they'll use in mochas, um, things like that. So it's it's very very versatile in its use. Mm -hmm. It sounds. Like it just because you've made a foundation of all the different kind of categories of flavor notes that you can then play off of in sort of any direction. That you exactly. Want. Yeah, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. So in my experience, North Americans are used to drinking hot cocoa, which is typically a thinner drink, less intense flavors. But uh, when I decided to offer drinking chocolate in my shop, um, you know, I'm doing it on a much smaller level than what you guys have got going on at Cho. And so I definitely went for the drinking chocolate angle, sort of the, I had a lot of people saying, I want hot chocolate like what I had in Paris or what I had in Italy. And so these really thick, dairy rich kind of uh, options. And so um, we developed a, a line of, I think at our top most we had 14 flavors. And some of them were totally crazy, and some of them were much more standard. So we, you know, had of course dark milk, white hazelnut, and then we had peppermint. But then we went all the way to like, you know, balsamic uh, vinegar or um, yeah. Parmesan cheese. Drinking chocolate was actually one of our most uh, most popular. People really wanted to come in and, and check that one out. So it's Parmesan <laughs> cheese drinking chocolate. Yeah, yeah. So Vancouver. Okay has a drinking chocolate festival every January for a month and we offered a new flavor each week and for the last three years I think so um, we did it for the festival and people just flocked in to try it and the thing is that when you use a salty savory flavor with a nice dark chocolate you can get this really beautiful savory experience that's completely different from the sweet thing that we're used to and that for me was a really fun space to to really play in and I sort of started to think about drinking chocolate in this in, and flavors in the same way that I think about my bonbons like how can I make this an intense layered rich experience for somebody who's going to come in and enjoy this cup so um, it's really really fun so but I really went for like the rich angle and we did have some lighter options obviously you could always mix it with milk or water instead of cream we also had vegan options we used coconut milk or almond milk um, to steam our drinking chocolate mixes with um, in terms of Cho um, what has the response been when you introduced a more decadent chocolate drink to the North American market who maybe aren't as accustomed to such a rich drink it's been a really great response. Um, similar to you, in, in our store, uh, we had a lot of fun with playing with custom drinks. Um, you know, we, we created a really nice base, and so it's great for us to play with, and then it's also been really, really popular to our customers, um, both on the consumer side and then a lot of cafes. Uh, like Blue Bottle, for example, is a, a coffee roaster that we work with and we do the mochaccino chocolate bar. They use our drinking chocolate for all their cafes to make their mochas. And so they, as they've been growing, our demand's been growing, and a lot of other um, you know, people have been wanting it so much that we're trying to you know, figure out new, new machines in order to help us um, scale the, the grinding of it because we grind it into this kind of a finer chunky powder mm -hmm. um, even though it's it's actually just pure dark chocolate ground but when you grind it up 
it makes it easier for you to melt it. So if you're just going to pour a little bit of hot water on it, the best way is just to pour a little bit and melt a paste first, and then you can blend that in any way that you want with milk or with just water or into any other drink. We actually had a uh, drinking chocolate contest to see what kind of wild ideas people could come up with, and I think one of the winning ones was the sparkling mojito ginger beer chocolate cold drink you know so it's it really can be done a lot of different ways that sounds delicious um yeah that's uh that, that's a similar process to what I what I was using and and one of the most important considerations is the texture of the chocolate and then also of course the flavor and so you know, for me, I, I used a whole bunch of different approaches. Because I was in a small shop and I wasn't making for it for mass distribution, I could do things like take that powder that I made similar to your process and then to, um, you know, add an orange concentrate to it when we steamed it or add a tea concentrate or something like that to kind of make, we would make our own concentrates in the store and then we'd add them and play with the flavors that way. And so one year we did a red wine um, reduction, red wine and apple reduction, and so we made a red wine and apple sauce, and then that got steamed in. And so, for me, every time I want to think about the flavor, I'm also thinking about the texture and what the best way to deliver that flavor is, and still maintain that perfectly smooth, lovely texture. Because often is people just add spices, and then you get this like gritty, powdery kind of mouth feel that interferes with your perception of the flavor, and. Uh, so what kind of challenges did you have when you were developing your products to make sure that the texture and the flavor are maintained? Um, I mean, we do, a, you know, we have a tasting panel, so we have to taste as we're making it, and that way we can make any adjustments um, during the final stages of, the, of each batch. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's been some... Um, adjustments like mainly with like acidity like maybe one batch is more acidic so then we might tone it down a little bit um, just by blending it um, so but overall um, it's it's been uh, fairly consistent and uh, a really great product for us yeah yeah I like I definitely encourage chocolatiers that I'm talking to if they have a, a space or if they want to distribute to cafes that working in the drinking chocolate space is actually um, it's it can be really economical as a product to get out on the in the like get out into the world. There's not a lot of specialized equipment that you need to really increase your product line and make something very wholesaleable. And so I'm always like like if you want to really you know get out in the wholesale market, that's a good way to go. So um so it's obviously becoming more common that chocolatiers are offering drinking chocolate and there are many different styles and recipes and I mean I've found obviously most popular like the classics um, and you know dark and spicy kind of flavors where you know there's that throwback to the sort of ancient Aztec thing people are really into that um, it's been very very fun um, and so, speaking of recipes, you made this super berry drinking chocolate with all these different berries, raspberry, blueberry, black currant, um, and we don't often see the inclusions of berries, so like where, how did that start, and how did you, you know, move in that direction? Um, well, I think a lot of flavor pairings, and um, in a lot of chocolates, there are those really nice kind of berry, juicy, raspberry uh, tones and um, so I was tasked to experiment with drinking chocolate and you know we played with a bunch of different stuff we played with spicy and we played with chai and and um, and the superberry it just turned into something really fun and uh, working with um, you know uh, fruit powders so mm -hmm. a raspberry powder and um, the acai and black currant and blueberry um, gave it just this really interesting texture, really thick and uh, but fine enough that it just blends and um, so it's a nice way to have it be solid. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because certainly you could add like a liqueur as you're making it um, yep. or like a raspberry syrup when you're serving it, but to make it in a you know in a in a form that you can sell in a canister, um, you know, using the 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 
fruit powders was a good way to do that. And so um, just, uh, you know, blending to, to get a balanced flavor profile and uh, the, the berries is just a really nice pairing. We also did a, uh, a peppermint, but we called it pepper squared mint. And uh, so it was peppermint with um, cubeb pepper also. Like a, it's like a black pepper, but it has a little kind of minty tone to the cu cubeb pepper. So it's like a little spice on, on peppermint. Um, and that was a really fun one, a little more kind of holiday tones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my, you mentioned liqueurs, and I'm always envious of, of places where chocolatiers can serve their drinking chocolate with liqueurs because I think that the, um, just the, the options are so wide and you can make all these great drinking chocolate cocktails and things like that. And one of my favorite hot chocolate experiences was in Italy where, you know, my drinking chocolate in the morning came with Frangelico in it whether I wanted it to or not. <laughs> It's pretty pretty amazing, and where I live, it's not it's really difficult for us to be able to serve that way in a cafe setting. But um, I was a little bit envious of people who can. No, we uh, do not serve that in our cafe. But I definitely was at a cocktail party, and I um, actually had gone to this uh, coffee conference, and I gave a talk on drinking chocolate and a demo how to make it. And um, I had some left over from the demo, and I, I brought it to the cocktail party. So it was nice at room temperature, just you know, in a Cambro type container. Um, but it's still liquid enough, depending on the, the balance. We do it with about just one-to-one -one water and then the uh, granules, the drinking chocolate granules, and mm -hmm. blend it with an immersion blender is the easiest way to just get it fully integrated. Um, and then you just let that sit and come to room temperature, and you can pour it into cocktails. So we were blending it with rum and some orange bitters and some little spices, and it made, you know, over ice, and we grated a little bit of chocolate on top, and it just made this fabulous cocktail. People were, the whole party was freaking out about it. So it's a really fun way to enjoy it at home, you know, just to, for holidays or something like that. It's, it's a really yeah. good way to use it. For sure. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, like, formulation on the spot, like what you're talking about, how you actually serve. So uh, in my shop, we, um, <clears throat> we actually used our espresso steamer to get everything all emulsified together. And so we didn't need another piece of equipment. So for people who have an espresso steamer at home or in their shop, it's a very easy way. If you have the powder fine enough, you can just add your liquid and you'll get a beautiful emulsified hot drink within seconds. Um, if you don't have that, then, you know, a nice way is to, you know, just heat it on the stove and whisk it and just let it sit and you can use it cold or hot then afterward, as Sahara mentioned. Um, and then one of the things I love about drinking chocolate, like I'm not going to give any specific recipes because it's your own. Like you take the powder and you take your liquid and you build it to the texture and the flavor that you want. And it's really uh, interesting, easy space to play in. Um, if you're just experimenting, if you're a chocolatier who's serving something, or if you're a foodie at home who wants to make something great. Um, and I just find it really uh, easy kind of place to play. So uh, what are you dreaming up next, Zahara? What's, uh, what, do you have anything new in the works that you're excited about that you can well um, I think when we open our new cafe in Berkeley, we'll get to play around with a lot of new drinks. Um, we just moved our whole factory from San Francisco uh, to Berkeley, and so we're looking forward to having a store again there where we can play around with a lot of fun drinks. It's, it's nice for us to um, play with things in the store, and then we can you know, think back if we want to turn it into a product as well. Um, but so currently, um, you know, mainly waiting for uh, that to happen and working on um, other chocolate bar products rather than um, expanding the drinking chocolate line currently. Yeah. What's the um, expected opening of your cafe? Is there like an estimated arrival time? Um, it keeps kind of moving around a little bit. I'm expecting probably beginning of 2015. Okay, just for, you know, we might have some listeners in the Bay Area who might want to come check it out. So, it's yeah, good to know. we're excited to have that open soon. Keep your eye out for it. Um, so, do you have anything else to add, Zahara? Um, I mean, sure, there's lots we could talk about. Um, 
<laughs> but uh, on specific, oh, I guess we were talking about home, how to make it at home. I mean, you know, a lot of people now do have the immersion blenders, and that is really the best way to integrate, um, you know, to get your uh, solids to emulsify within a liquid. Um, but if you don't have that, the, the best way to do it is to take your um, solids, so your, your drinking chocolate granules, and then use uh, boiling water and then pour it over slowly, just a little bit, and use a whisk or even a fork or a spoon and just slowly melt it with the heat of the hot water. The hot water should be enough, the boiling water should be enough to melt the chocolate and build your paste up. And so by working with the, the solids to turn it into a melted paste, then you can slowly add the rest of your liquid and just integrate it little by little as you work up the, the liquid emulsion. Um, and then you can add that paste to milk or any type of ratio that you want to do or cocktails or just blend it in any, any fashion that you want. So that's probably the easiest way to do it at home if you don't have an immersion blender or a uh, steamer like you like you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds delicious. So um, I think that's it for today. I'm going to close with a thank you to Zahara Mapes from Cho for taking time out of your busy day to join our conversation and help us all to understand more about hot chocolate. Thanks so much for listening.